just a reminder, you can catch me recording this podcast live on AMP. AMP is a new live radio app that lets you call in and chat with me in person while recording. Get the app on Apple's App Store and make sure you follow me at John Middlecoff to get notified when I go live. What is going on, everybody? John Middlecoff, three and out podcast. Special guest today, former NFL GM, current podcaster of the GM Shuffle, Michael Lombardi, joins us for a long interview about the NFL, uh, the running back situation, and just what Al Davis and Bill Walsh might think of 2023 in the landscape of football. So we will discuss that all coming up as well. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. If you're watching this on YouTube, smash that like button, subscribe to the page, leave a comment below. We have a lot of merch, especially three and out merch for you on the volume.com. Go to the volume.com, search this podcast merch and get yourself a trucker out. They look good. They are headed to me currently in transit, so get on that as well. We have a ton of content for you and a lot of podcasts coming up, so enjoy former NFL GM Mike Lombardi. But first, do you have the Game Time app on your phone? Because if you don't, here's what I need you to do. I need you to grab your smartphone. I need you to download uh, the Game Time app. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in America. I have it. You should have it too. I went to Morgan Wallen twice last week. Second time, game time took care of me up front. Why? They got the best ticket prices. And when you use the promo code John, that's promo code J-O-H-N, you get $20 off. You want to go to football games this fall? Get on it. Promo code John, $20 off. NFL games, college football games, baseball games, obviously concerts. Get out and have some fun and do it on me. Promo code John, game time app, the official ticketing app of this podcast. $20 $20 off game time, promo code John. Do it and do it now. Very, very excited for this one. I have, uh, I, don't, I don't even know how to introduce him. Either, you know, longtime NFL executive or just podcast media star, <laughs> yeah, right. Mike Lombardi. <laughs> yeah. How are you doing? I'm good. I, I just, I think the only reason that I actually do this is because I say what I think and I don't really have to worry about anything. I'm too old. So it's a good thing, you know, kind of uh, allows you to get away with more stuff than you could. My, my, uh, my last year working in the NFL, I remember being at the combine and I, I was leaving, you know, where the interviews were and people were kind of making their way out. And somehow I stumbled on the street with this other guy and his name was Mick Lombardi. Yeah. And, and we, and we started to talk and, I, I didn't keep in touch with him or whatever, but I remember the time he was he was just becoming the assistant to the head coach for a guy named Jim Harbaugh, and yeah, then yeah. Uh, and uh, I was thinking about it today, knowing you were coming on, and he's obviously gone on now. He's the, the offensive coordinator, and he's become a coach in the league. He works for the Raiders. Got to be pretty cool, you know, for all the success you had and working in the league, and to see your sons go on to be coaches and not, and not just work for any for, I mean, the Raiders, the 49ers franchises that you had worked for. That's, that's it's gotta fun. be a pretty cool professional accomplishment or personal accomplishment for yourself. You know, it, it, obviously a lot of it goes to the mother because how they raised them. But I, I think, you know, when I, when they, we were all in Cleveland, Stephen Belichick and Mick hung out with Brian Belichick. And so all those kids were there. And then, you know, Jim, when we were talking before we came on the air, Jim had a home up in Montclair too, right near where I lived. And so Jay Harbaugh and my son, Mick, they went to school together. So they became close. So it's kind of good to see all these kind of my son, Matthews, now at the Raiders, all these kids that kind of played together in a backyard, all kind of now become NFL coaches, which is kind of neat, you know, and all of them have paid their dues. You know, Mick started out as a grad, basically started out as a, a, an intern in New England and worked his way up. Matthew started out as an intern in Cleveland, went to work for Bobby Petrino, so it isn't like you say, well, you know, they got jobs because of their dad. No, they, they had to actually go through the process. You know, they got in the door, but they had to stay. They had to get through the door. How come you think they coached and didn't want to scout? Uh, because I told them to coach. Because uh, coaching, you can't lie. You can't lie coaching. You, your tape tells you what you do. In personnel, you can always make something up. I didn't like that guy. You know, I like that guy. They didn't listen to me. It's all full of a bunch of, you're always right. And so the only way you can control your occupation is to coach. And I made that really clear to them. Uh, I didn't coach. 
And, and, and I lived through the personnel world where people took credit for things they didn't do. People gave blame for things that they did. It's kind of a, a really a very third world country kind of life. You know, there's always revolutions and counter revolutions within organizations. So I wanted them to coach. I've had this kind of thing that football has really become kind of Wall Street on grass with the amount of money. Now, that's right down the street from me, Jonathan Gannon, who was a coordinator for two years, bought a $10 million home. Ten million. Is, this isn't Belichick or Andy Reid. This is a guy, first-time head coach, who's been a coordinator for two years. That, that's the type of money that's flowing around. Yeah. Obviously, your son's working it now. You've seen it. They, they, you get well compensated being a coach. Do you think that's influenced and changed the sport from a coaching slash GMing standpoint of just the craziness behind the scenes because of how much money's on the line now? Well, there's, you know, your job security is less, right? Because people, even though they're paying you more, they have money to fire you quicker. You know, when I first started, the cap was, there was no cap. I think the TV contract was given $16 million per club. You know, now one player gets $16 million. You know, Christian Kirk makes $18 million as a receiver. So that's how much the league's changed. Look, you know, we, when we interviewed Belichick. He had his very first interview in 1989 as a head coach. He didn't get the job, Bud Carson did. But we interviewed him at the Hilton, which was the old Hilton in Mobile, Alabama, Ernie Acorsi and I. And and he had been a coordinator, won a Super Bowl. He couldn't, he could barely get head coaching interviews. And here's Jonathan Gannon, who basically gets a head coaching job. Why? Off of two years of being a coordinator, which for me watching his tape was less than spectacular. Like I didn't see it. You know, I didn't see it. I saw Shane Steichen's tape be pretty good, the way they handled Jalen Hurts and the way they developed that offense. I got that. I'm not saying he's ready, but I think we're putting guys in jobs. They're not even ready to be coordinators, and we're giving them head coaching jobs, and then we're mad because they're not ready for the job. How is that ever going to change, though? Because now the hype machine, you talk about this a lot on your podcast, is just out of control. The agents have so much juice. And let's face it, the owners – you just saw the amount of money. Every team got what three seventy five. Well, the salary cap's two hundred. So even once you pay everyone else in the building, they they have so much freaking money. It's just outrageous. Well, they're that... buying yachts. They're buying. They're, <laughs> buying yachts. they're not buying boats. They're buying yachts. I mean, that did you ever me. think that was possible back when you first got in the league in the eighties? Yeah, the amount I mean, of money. I, I never. I mean, who knew? Who could have envisioned that? But yeah, you knew they were going to make it. I, I think to me, the the owners get influenced by they listen to a lot of the wrong people oftentimes and they don't really understand what their core business is. And so they let people advise them on their core business. And so it falls into a, you know, let's hire this guy, let's hire that guy. And now that they're paying so much money to coaches, I mean, the fact that Jonathan Gannon's in this, you know, is, is became a head coach or I'm not picking on Jonathan, but I mean, like to me, that, that you don't have to serve an apprenticeship to get a head coaching job. You know, I say this on my pod all the time. You call three first downs in a row, you're a head coaching candidate. Yeah. Like Don Martindale or Jonathan Gannon, who's more ready to be a head coach? Martindale couldn't even get an interview with Arizona, right? And so, but Martindale's too old, doesn't look the part. A lot of this is political. You Do you miss being in the NFL at all? No, not at all. No, I mean, I... I, I have my NFL. I mean, I can watch games. I watch tape. I study the game. I basically, what I do for VEASAN is the same thing I did when I was in the league. I break down games. I, I handicap teams. You could, you could say it's handicapped for the betting market, but, you know, I go, okay, Cincinnati's good in this area. Here's their strengths. Here are their weaknesses. Here's, their, here's where you should attack them. It's the same thing I did when I was in the league. I enjoy that. So I still have that where I now I don't have to worry about Am I, you know, what does this guy think or who's evaluating me? Once I wrote Good Iron Genius, uh, I I gained personal freedom and I just didn't really, I didn't need to be validated by somebody who was above me to say, oh, he knows what he's talking about or he doesn't. Yeah. Can't I mean, it's. Freedom. I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I mean it in a free of freedom way, you know, where it's, it was an independence. It felt really good. Well, one thing, I, one big reason you've always resonated with me, and I, I've done this since once I left the league, I didn't really care ever aspirations to go back. You just kind of say what you feel, and, and you talk. You, you know, you see hard knocks; they think it's inhumane to show a player being cut now, and whether that's correct or not, 
players are cut. This is the point of training yeah. camp to go from 90 to 53. Like that's, that's the whole point of August is to figure out your team. So we just, are we just not acknowledging what's really going on? Because we know once you go to those personnel meetings, how the conversations actually go, like that's the way coaches and GMs actually talk. So it's just, I, I think uh, clearly one reason you've had a lot of success is you speak like it's actually spoken and that, that's hard to find. You see these former GMs now on, on TV, they don't say anything. It's like, well, that's not how you actually talk. What do, what are we, what are we gaining? Well, I mean, I, I just finished this last book called football done right. And I wrote a chapter about television, you know, and it was a really educational chapter for me because when I was researching the chapter, I wanted to really understand the impact of television on the NFL and truly kind of get to what what made the game where it went from 16 million per TV contract to where it is today. And I, I think it comes down to three people mostly. It comes down to Howard Cosell, Brett Musburger, and Jimmy the Greek on the NFL today, and then it, the great John Madden. And Howard Cosell really turned the tide because what people don't realize is Monday Night Football was not something any no network wanted. CBS was offered Monday Night Football at first, and they said no chance. We've got Gunsmoke, we've got Andy Griffith, we've got these, pro, we got all these great programs. We have no interest. Is, is they, that because those show? Is that because those shows were doing 20, 30 million people watching, so they didn't even they want had to risk 33% it? Thirty three percent of the market share on that night. Monday Night was yeah. appointment television, so nobody was going to miss Andy. Nobody was going to miss Gunsmoke. Nobody was going to miss that show. They were sitting in their chairs with their TV guy watching it. No DVR. Yeah. Then NBC had Rowan and Martin in the Dar- 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 Day show, and they said we want nothing to do with it. ABC said we'll take it for sixteen million for three years. And Rune Arledge said, we got to put somebody in the booth who's going to say something, who's going to stir some interest. And he put Cosell in there, a former attorney who was more known for being Muhammad Ali's friend than he was anything. And as he said, he said, if we see it, we have to say it. And so the first night, Cleveland playing the Jets in Municipal Stadium, the ABC switchboard lit up. 50% of the people liked Cosell, 50% hated him, but everybody watched and it grew the game, and it made Monday Night Football must-watch television, whereas Andy and Gunsmoke and Rowan, they all f- faded away. And then when Brent came in with the NFL Today and the Greek, and they started talking about betting, but not talking about betting, all of a sudden, you know, now that really blossomed. So for me, the point of the story is I, I when I read that and when I was researching Cosell, we don't have enough people – basically seeing what they say. I mean, we got somebody yesterday, I mean, saying Nick Nick Saban's legacy is in jeopardy this year. Are you serious? Are you serious? I mean, you know, Bill Belichick's on the hot seat. Great. Fire Belichick. You're going to get a better coach than Belichick? You know, like, like seriously. Like, we have things that are being said that nobody really puts any facts behind them. Let's let's talk about that bill specifically because the saving thing's stupid. We all acknowledge, and you've seen him firsthand for decades. I worked for a guy whose career was made Pat Hill because of Bill elevating him, and Pat is, I mean, never stopped talking about the lessons. And my football base was on stuff that he saw from your time in Cleveland. But is there, you know, coaches sometimes it's whether it's a message go stale or just he's been there a long time. And the success, the bar that him and Tom set was so high, it's impossible to get to. Is it fair a conversation to be had? They're never going to upgrade Belichick, but maybe, and I know you're close to him. Is it understandable? Because obviously he's a better coach than John Harbaugh or Mike Tomlin, guys that never feel like they're on the hot seat. But is this just one of those that's an inevitable breakup that just happens in coaching? Or is that that's how you view of, it? Whenever you have a lot of success, everybody wants to claim the success, right? And so, you know, and we saw Asante Samuel come out the other day and scream that, you know, Belichick has nothing to do with the winning in New England. It was all Brady, which is the most ridiculous thing of all time. You know, because the last time I checked, Brady didn't play defense. And in that first Super Bowl, they, they won against the Rams. They beat the, they stopped the greatest show on turf. So in the last Super Bowl, they won against the Rams. They scored 13 points. So I'm not sure Asante watched those games. So we'll see. But to me, I think whenever you have a lot of success, people want credit. Whenever you have a lot of expectations, people want to kind of keep turning. But then you look at the San Antonio Spurs. I mean, have they won the last three years? 
No. I don't think they've won in like seven. So they just rewarded Popovich with a huge contract. They have the highest paid coach in the league is Monty Williams because they know that there's going to be some downtimes because of the way the system is set up. It's hard to dominate. It's hard to have a great team all the time. That's what makes you New England so rare. I mean, we're in an era of a cap. We're in an era of the worst team picks. I mean, when you go through the when you go through the Patriots draft selections of where they pick, I think this year was the highest pick with Gonzalez until they traded down that they've picked since. You'd have to go back to the uh, Richard Seymour draft. Think about that for a minute. Yeah, it's the highest they've picked, and the system is built on you know losers get the high picks, winners get the low picks, and so yeah, I mean. I, 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 I'm not disputing they're frustrated in New England. I think he certainly has a good team. He'll turn it around. I think last year, and I've said it on my pod, was a mistake to allow Matt Patricia to run the offense. I think everybody kind of knows that. But I think more than all of this, you know, if they would have had Pat Hill to coach the offensive line up there in New England, it might have been able to hide some of the problems because Pat's a really good line coach. They didn't have that. And I think that's probably the biggest issue of all. Well, now they're kind of in a position, right? They could be better with Bill and their offense could be better. We know they're going to be good on defense and special teams. But the division, if Rodgers, you know, just incrementally makes them more competitive, we know the Bills are solid. And you could argue the Dolphins, even if Tua were to get hurt, just how good their skill guys are with Mike White could just keep them afloat, unlike last year. That division, you could compete to win nine games and obviously the AFC not make the playoffs. It's just going to be very, very difficult. It's hard, yeah. I mean, but look, you know, the reason we're in this business is because it's hard. There's yeah. nothing that makes it easy. There's no, you know, it's like John Kennedy said on the campus of the Rice. You know, we go to the moon because it's hard, not because it's easy. You you win a championship because it's hard. I mean, it's going to be a challenge. And I think I think they have a team. Look, we know this for all the talk about offensive football, for all the talk about you know the skill players. The game comes down to who can stop the opponent. And who plays the most physical? I mean, I think that's what it comes down to. And on paper, no one's won a championship on paper. If that were the case, Texas would win the national championship every year. Or, you you know, I mean, so, or Buffalo should have at least two Super Bowls by now. You got to play the games. I mean, look, the Jets have won two, two in Robert Sala's years there. They've won two AFC East games. That's all they've won. I mean, they haven't proven that they they're they have they've been the 13 playoff games since 1968 when Namath declared them the the, the, the we're going to win it. 13. They haven't been no playoffs since 2010. Like that just doesn't happen overnight. You got to get good before you get great. Do you think the dynamics there could be a little out of whack, given yeah. how desperate they were for Rodgers? The Hackett yeah. clearly another you saw, you hire him basically to, for Rodgers. It feels like it's a very slippery slope. It's either going to work or. It, it could yeah. unravel quick. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's going to, I think we're going to, they're going to go through, like any good team, they're going to go through hard times, right? So they're going to struggle and they're, they're going to find out what character is the team, how tough is the team. And look, every team has holes. Their offensive line. Can Makai Becton play right tackle? Does he want to play right tackle? You know, can you really count on Dwayne Brown to be your left tackle? Lakeland Tomlinson did not play good at left guard last year. So, like, like, like I don't know how it's all going to work out. But they're not like a lock. I mean, Salah said they're one of the six of the seven best teams in the league. I missed that memo. Like, I missed that, you know? And so, do you know how many turnovers they created defensively in the last eight games of the season? Take a guess. This elite defense that everybody talks about. Not many. Not many. Two. In eight games. They created two turnovers in eight games. I mean, that's not that that's not on the elite level. It's one of the reasons why Washington was eight and eight. They couldn't create turnovers. So I I think we I look, do I think the Jets are better? No question. Do I think they'll be a formidable opponent? Yeah, no question. But they gotta play the games to find out. And coaching matters in the NFL. How you get your team ready and how your team improves during the year matters. Yeah, you know, speaking of coaching, you've been around Brian Dayball. Clearly, he had a fantastic season last year for New York. You know, speaking of television, you know, you turn on the four-letter network, every former player saying, Pam, 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 Pam. I look at Saquon Barkley, and if he plays for this $10 million, over a six-year career, he will have averaged $8 million. I mean, there are some players, right, making eight hundred grand that probably should be making $15 million. He's a guy, okay, maybe he should make a couple million more, but it's not, we're talking 10 15%. 
So when he's yeah. when I see him talking like he's getting totally screwed, yeah, you're off a little bit. But I, you're in this, you're in the same vicinity. And w- were they getting screwed when he was MIA? All the when they were paying him a premium those years when he was injured, it goes both ways. W- what's your overall thought on, on this situation and just the overall standing of the the running backs not being happy with their standing in the league? Well, it's a supply and demand thing, John. Right? I mean, it's collectively bargained. So. You know, Barkley, to me, where I have a disagreement with Barkley is he doesn't impact the passing game. He averages under six yards a catch. Like, I would pay Austin Eckler. I would have paid Josh Jacobs. Josh Jacobs is a force in the passing game. Austin Eckler deserves to get paid more money. I don't disagree. I would rather pay Austin Eckler more than pay Keenan Allen, the slot receiver. I would rather pay Josh Jacobs more than $15 million to Hunter Renfro. But the system's kind of backwards. I don't disagree with that, but Barkley – Averages under six yards to catch. You know, it's it's Barkley should be angry at the Giants because they gave Jones all this money when we all know, you and I both know, their offense has to work around Jones, not through Jones. And so, you know, Barkley's not working for charity either now. We don't know what he turned down, right? Yeah. We don't know how much money he, he could have turned down a ton of money. But we don't know what he turned out. He's just not happy that the position isn't getting paid, nor is it going up. But once again, that's supply and demand. I mean, Kareem Hunt's sitting out of here. Aaron Jones is a better back than Saquon Barkley in terms of all the things he does. He took a pay cut. I think Josh Jacobs is a better player than Saquon Barkley. There's if no I, question. I, I, I would take Jacobs over Saquon. Oh, I would too. But he doesn't have the media behind him. He doesn't have the New York media behind him. He wasn't the second pick overall in the draft. And then he wasn't a great player for his first three years. He didn't flash. I mean, last year he had two, 340 carries. He averaged almost five yards a carry. I mean, the guy was disruptive in the passing game. He got stronger as the game went on, uh, played hurt. I, I think the guy's sensational. But, you know, he's in the parking lot waiting to think he's got his deal done. That's how close it was. And it just he – didn't, he, he didn't take the deal. His agent apparently said don't take the deal or somebody told him not to take the deal. Do you think well, if we they would have what let... that deal is though? Like we don't know what. The, like we're saying they're underpaid. We're saying they're not getting respected. But these two guys turned down deals. What did they turn down? Do you think if the Giants would have let them both hit free agency and just tag neither of them, would Daniel Jones have got a big offer somewhere? No, of course not. That's what I said on my podcast. And so when Daniel Jones comes back to you, because you're going to be the highest bidder no matter what, right? And and you and I both know quarterbacks don't leave to go somewhere else. They they want to stay with their team. They want to stay where they're comfortable. They don't just – I mean, Kirk Cousins left because he couldn't stay, right? And he wanted to get out of that toxic environment. But for the most part, they want to stay. And so I would have said to – I would have just let them both. I would have easily let them both. Well, I, I, see, I don't think you can be a general manager in the National Football League today and be scared of free agency. Like, I don't think you'd be scared of it. I think you got to be realistic enough to say, okay, that guy's liable. That guy's going to get paid. Where most teams make big mistakes are when they get a guy for cheap. Okay, they bring a guy in, like Jarrett Stidham. The Raiders bring Jarrett Stidham in. He plays two games, one really good game against the Niners. When they try to sign him back, they they still remember that nobody was after him when they got him. Yeah. And then he hits the open market, and he's got six or seven offers out there. See, that's when you get in a little bit of a problem because you remember the guy before you brought him in. But when you know a guy who you when you know who the guy is, why are you scared of free agency? And here's what we'll pay. Do you it's think it's not the NBA where you if you don't pay if you don't pay Bradley Beal, you don't get a good player? Like there's other players out there. Is that a learned skill that you know Walsh or Belichick? to be almost numb to the emotion with guys, or is that something yeah. that they have pretty early? Just uh, That's the they way they think about it. They had it early because they both had a sense of, I don't want to call it arrogance, but they had a sense of everybody's replaceable, you know, except three or four guys. You know, and I mean, the only reason Walsh went out and, fought and traded for Steve Young was because, you know, Joe got hurt. And Bill was very good at understanding – Like Bill would have been, had Bill been around Russell Wilson, he would have traded Russell Wilson because he kind of, Bill could see when a quarterback's coming to an end. Speaking about quarterbacks when they're coming to the beginning, Justin Fields is a guy I know you're not super high on. I'm starting to, I don't know if you saw, he had a quote 
somewhere on a podcast the last couple of days that he guaranteed he's going to throw for 4,000 yards. In the history of the franchise, no one ever has. Now, granted, they're not getting Montana, Young, Favre, Rogers aren't playing for the Bears, but still, I mean, do you think your expectations for him are not high, correct? Well, I mean, he's never demonstrated he's a thrower of the football. I mean, he's a one-look-and-run guy. And in the simple past, there are problems from his mechanics fall apart. He's got a very flimsy delivery. And, you know, it can go on. the. It's like a golfer. You can go on the practice range and not have a bad swing. But when you get to a tournament and the pressure is on, that's, that bad swing might show up again. And so his decision-making, I mean, it's one-look-and-go. And the way people defend them now is if they keep them in the pocket and say, you beat me at quarterback, you play quarterback from behind the center and beat me. See if you can do that. It becomes a harder game. And, you know, he has to run and move. And once people take that away, I mean, he he's turned the ball over at an unbelievable rate. He's been sacked 91 times. Now, that's not all because they got a shitty line. He holds the ball. He doesn't make quick decisions. It doesn't process through them. Will he get better? I hope so. But to go from where you are to 4,000, that's a, that's that's too big of a leap. How do you factor in when you're in the GM seat, guys' circumstances around him? Sam Darnold's a good example, right? Had a very, very tough beginning to his career. And then right at the end in Carolina, really kind of showed signs of life. And clearly the 49ers saw something. And guys like Fields, for example, because it's easy to argue, well, he's had shitty stuff around him. Where you go, Trey Lance hasn't played that much, but it doesn't get any better, right? Yeah. Coach, talent. Is it usually just, well, I like this guy coming out, so I'm always going to like him? Is that yeah, how it tends to lead? I think that's the way it is, but I think you have to be realistic, right? Marcellus used to say this all the time, and, and we don't get this in the league because we, we go over the top. But there's probably only two quarterbacks that don't have to be managed in the league. And I know that word when you say being managed is kind of a condescending term towards a quarterback. But quarterbacks are like baseball stadiums. You, you've got to fit your team around the quarterback. You know, a baseball team wants to build its team to the park, right? You know, if you're Fenway, you got a short left field. You know, you build your team around the ballpark. Quarterbacks, you've got to build your team around the skill set of the quarterback. And Kyle does that really well. So when Kyle watches Sam Darnold, he doesn't see what Sam Darnold doesn't do. He sees what Sam Darnold can do in his scheme. Throw the ball inside the numbers. You know, get the ball out of his hand. Get it quick to somebody. It's the same thing with Garoppolo. Here's what we'll do with him. Here's how we'll build a team around Garoppolo. And I don't think teams do that enough. I think what Philly did with Jalen Hurts was really, really good. They they just said, okay, we can't really run drop back pass. If we don't if, if we go to a drop back pass game with Jalen Hurts, it's not going to work. We're not going to be able, he'll hold the ball, he'll stare down a receiver, it won't work. But if we run a six back offense where he's the main ball carrier, he's in the running game, and we run play action, all of a sudden it opens a lot of doors and he becomes a better player, right? And I think that's what we miss. And too many people want to run a scheme and not fit the player. I think Baltimore is an example. Like Lamar Jackson should be under center more because Lamar Jackson is a disruptive runner. And when he's under center, you don't know if he's going to run or if he's going to run or if he's passing. And you don't know if he's going to run a bootleg or if he's going to run a naked. And when he runs a bootleg, somebody's got to go out there with him. And he's, that's the only play in football where the, the, def, where the quarterback blocks somebody. You've got to build an offense around the skill set of the quarterback. And if you don't do that, and as a personnel director, you've got to build a, a team around that. Like Baltimore needs, Baltimore needs big receivers with extended wingspan because Lamar's going to throw the ball, and they're going to have. There's going to be a lot of times where you're going to have to make plays. But when you bring in little receivers, like Arizona side has Hollywood Brown and Rondell Moore, and they got a midget at quarterback. Like how oh, are yeah. we throwing the ball? <laughs> no, it doesn't make any sense. You know, I know you've been a fan of Lamar for a long, since he was coming out. Their offensive coordinator, now it's one thing to say it, it's another thing, we'll see what it actually looks like, but keeps talking about spreading it out, throwing it more. Doesn't that negate his great skill of movement and running around? Why, why yeah. would you, why would they do that? Because the media is telling them to do that. The media is telling them they need to do that. You got the the four, the, the worldwide leaders saying, you, need, you know, they got those experts on there that tell you what they need to do. <laughs> You know, one of the experts doesn't even think Joe Montana's a top five quarterback. So why would you pay attention? Like, seriously, like, 
like they they tell you this, like, no, like Lamar should be under center. It should be play action. You put Lamar with, with Kyle, what do you think his numbers would be? If you put Lamar and he had Debo Samuel, a great slant inside, because as great as Debo is, Debo's not an outside the number receiver. Debo's an inside the number receiver, and he's great with the ball in his hands, right? So Lamar, that's what Lamar needs. It's what A.J. Brown is. That's what made Hurts so good. They got a receiver that fit his skill set. Meanwhile, Baltimore's got these little guys. I know they got Bateman, and now they got Zay Jones. I mean, Zay, you know, the kid Flowers. Zay Flowers, I mean, yeah. Is it, you know, like you've got to fit you got to fit the receivers to the quarterback. You've told a story when you were in Cleveland. I think you interviewed him for the offensive coordinator job, but it was Kyle. And I think you, you told the owner and the, like this, this guy should be a head, the head coach. Yeah. When, when you think back talking to him, was that the first time you ever talked to him and what yeah. really stuck out when you spoke with him? His dad called me on the phone. I know his dad. Well, I love his dad. His dad said, you should interview Kyle for the OC. Now remember when Kyle's in Washington, he's getting killed in the press partly because of the owners leaking stuff to the media, the former general manager, you know, the whole RG3 thing, right? So we bring him in, and Mike Pettin's the head coach already. And he he goes in the interview, and he starts talking about his offense. And I'm sitting in the room, and he knows how to coach every single position, what he wants from every single position, what he's looking for from every single – like he went through the entire thing. Offensively, defensively would give some trouble – and it was the most impressive interview that I've had, uh, you know, other than like when we talked to Josh McDaniels at the, you know, when he was in New England, the same thing. I mean, those guys that understand how to move the football, they understand the whole game. They know what they know how everything ties together. They just don't know the they just don't know the play. They know the offense. And he was by far. He easily should have been the head coach. Easily. When you look at his quarterback situation. If I give you the hypothetical that Darnold beats out Lance, so Lance is the third string quarterback, assuming Purdy's okay, and all signs point to him on track. If you were in charge, would you keep him a like do you expect him to be on the team come week one if he's the third string quarterback? Well, I I don't think Lynch or Adam Peters are gonna want to trade him. They don't want to have to swallow that pill, right? You know, because they're the ones that really wanted him to do it. So I, I don't think they'll I, I think they'll keep him, but there's no way he can be the two because if you're Kyle, whoever if Purdy's the starter, you want somebody similar to Purdy that's going to go in there if you have to put him in, in the middle of the game and you got to go. Yeah. You don't want to change to where you got to change the offense a little bit where okay, now we need to go more. Because this whole conversation, do you remember how it all started about why they wanted uh they wanted uh to draft Trey Lance? Because Kyle's offense was getting stale. Remember that? That was the rhetoric that they needed to change the offense and do all that. So they just had like a record year last year offensively. Once somebody got in at quarterback, who knew what they were doing besides Garoppolo. They moved the ball because they, they just had- need a guy to complete passes. It's not that complicated. They it's got to run after the catch guys. Kyle makes the position really easy. Throw it to this guy. Make it so that you throw it to this guy while he's on the move because he'll run with it after the catch and you'll get all the yards. Yeah. I'll get you out of here on this. Uh, They're not around anymore, and I think they're two of the more historic guys in the history of the sport, Walsh and Al Davis. You've been around them. What do you think they would think of just 2023, the the National Football League? Well, I mean, Bill would have have embraced it. He would have been uh, divergent in thought. He would have looked at everything and would have come up with a a zig to the zag. Al would have been – you know, obsessed with how to stop the running quarterback. That would have, because bootlegs and nakeds drove him crazy, and this RPO stuff would have drove him crazy, because Al was a defensive coach at heart. He loved defensive football. And I think both men would have been, would have relished in the evolution of the game because they both loved the game so much. Do you think it's a little unfair how people remember him kind of for that last, especially my, you know, people like 45 yeah. and younger, that, that the last five, it, six it, years? It is kind of sad. I mean, he wasn't, you know, it was it was a part in his life where I think there were a lot of things going on for him. You know, he was not really adaptive to change. He didn't want to change and he didn't trust anybody. And the older he got, the less he trusted people. And he listened to a lot of wrong people. And he kind of fell into a, a comfortable area. It, he just it, it's just challenging when someone's as dominating and as great as he was and th- how they just leave 
kind of easily. And, and that was a hard thing. In my new book, I talk glowingly about him, about signing Lance Allworth, about, you know, being part of the tree, the Earl Blake tree that he was in, you know, in the press box for Sid Gilman when the Chargers were playing in San Diego. I mean, you got Sid Gilman on the sideline. You got Joe Mondro's line coach. Al Davis is the offense coordinator. And Chuck Knowles, the defense coordinator. That's the press box. Wow. And Jack Faulkner, the former director of player personnel, is on the sidelines too. Well, that's pretty impressive. That, that's all they had. What do you think he would have told you if when your son came walking into your office in 1999, you said he's going to be the offensive coordinator for your Raiders one day? Oh, you know, I mean, I wouldn't have believed it. But, I mean, look, it, it, it's a great opportunity for him. What would, it, what would Alice said? Oh, oh, kid, he would have just said, kid, he would have said the same thing he used to say to me. At some point, kid, you're going to have to play in the game. Well, Mike, I appreciate the time. Don't spend too much time at the beach. Football's right around the corner. Uh, Listen forward to listening to you on the GM Shuffle, and have a great day. Thanks, John. I appreciate you.